So these are some questions that come from all around the world. Mm. And I'll start with this uh, first one, and it's in terms of persistence in practice. Mm -hmm. And a friend asks, how important is having a fixed routine? Does it have, does it have a big impact on Dhamma progress, producing wholesome actions, mental qualities, or it doesn't really matter much? Should you have persistence, or can you just like, well, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, it depends on every individual. So if there is a person with, a, with, with, with tendencies of complete kind of disorganization, laziness, cannot adhere to basic worldly routine or discipline, then yeah, it's very helpful just to you know get your mind in a certain sense of responsibility and stick into the well, stick into the training uh, but then you have the other type of an individual that uh, would be pretty much holding the view that training routine um, being methodical precise is the training is the development of Dhamma which it isn't it's just an external form so you have to see which individual you are and if you are the, the former then yeah get some routine to keep you in check if you're the latter then maybe you know become more kind of less routine based and experience that you know mind sort of floating away without having anything fixed to do or to adhere to uh, because either way that's not the Dhamma so um, you know, the reflections you should be making on the level of practice of Dhamma, the accomplishment in virtue, that's not a method, that's not a routine. That comes with insight and repetition and the training and sustaining the effort. If the routine helps you for that, you do it. But sometimes the routine can take place instead of that. And all you, and you start, all I have to do is the routine and I'm practicing the Dhamma. I just get up at this, do this, do this, do this. I finish the day. It's, it's, a, success, it's a successful day because I've successfully completed my routine. Uh, that's not how the progress in Dhamma is measured so and you might be kind of in between so you start with a routine but then keep yourself in check in case you start taking routine in that um, in that kind of uh, mechanical sense whereby as I said I just need to go through routine and then I'll be anxiety free and worry free because I completed my duty so if you're taking it as a duty, it's not the Dhamma, it's not the virtue anymore. It's the external projection of it. Because <coughs> you can become like a, an un, a, a robot, you know, it's unaware of what's exactly, actually exactly. going on. Exactly, that's the risk of it always. But sometimes you can be too loose and sometimes you can be too tight. Yeah. So you can't just always, yes, routines are always good. Because somebody might be already too tight and too externally projected on the sense of duty and observances and stuff that they do. Uh, in which case, no, they need to loosen up actually these routines to get that sense of, whoa, my mind, my responsibility, my choice, my intention. Mm -hmm. uh, but then you have the other individual who is too loose, who is just absolutely, and it's equally no sense of responsibility or intention because it's too loose. Nothing's taken internally, taken on. Uh, so then, yeah, they would need some external adherence to the certain you know, routines and principles just to you know, get them a bit into 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 shape and and again in terms of persistence you know just you you persistently for example keeping the precepts sure you, you, know, you just you have to build it up anyway. yes exactly like people can take <coughs> people can take persistence to mean i'll just you know adhere to your determination and persist that's one way of persistence sure but persistence is exactly that. Like it can be much more relaxed, yet still persistent. Like you, you don't have specific determination to adhere to do, but at the same time, you don't do certain actions. You are not going against the precepts, so you are persistent. You are persistently maintaining and protecting the basis of your virtue, that in return protects the basis of your mind. So sometimes if you feel you're getting looser, maybe you need to you know, build up some determination or something, but not as a rule of thumb. Like, I always must have this, this persisting determination and focus. 
No, because sometimes that, that, that can be the reason for you not seeing where the practice is. It's too tight. And that often, you know, the simile that the Buddha gave, the, the, the lute strings. Like you want to play the music with them, but you will not be able to play the music if the strings are too tight or too loose. So you need to find the right balance. So if you are one who is really trying, at least, uh -huh. you're really trying and you're persisting and you feel there is some you know development mm. at least you know calmness and mm. uh, dispassion and then you fail you make a mistake you break a precept mm. now you just you know it feels like all all your work is kind of lost mm. sometimes you know, it's is it is that the case you think what's the attitude then for that person because you can really oh, right. fall, you well can yeah feel no, like now the mind tries to go the other way exactly i've so really messed up now yeah, yeah. You know. well it depends uh depends what what piece you broke to what extent how much and so on yeah if it's like those serious precepts of killing or something like that then yeah maybe you have messed up mm. but if it's not on that level then yeah you messed up but not in a sense of that you cannot grow out of it now as in you messed up sure you recognize the mistake and now you basically be even more aware next time but it's good actually like i know the mind can can fall into that trap of like uh, negativity about oh i messed up it's unworthless and all of that and you have to endure it because that's pretty much the result of you messing up so don't just try to like, oh, you know, I shall not think these thoughts. Because um, feeling bad about messing up when you were actually intentionally messed up and broke the precepts will, as I said, make you more mindful next time. If you don't try to negate that bad feeling and allow it to endure as long as it lasts. So basically you're taking on more weight of your action of messing up through enduring that pain which is a result of you messing up. So then, uh, then uh, you know, as you pick up your precepts again, when the, when the challenges come, well, the, the, the memory of pain will be fresh. Pain of how it was when I chose to break the precepts. So then you will not necessarily do it so easily. Pain of regret. Exactly. The remorse. Remorse. Remorse, guilt, can be very useful. Sure, mm -hmm. can be irrational, in which case you have to be aware of that as well, and not unnecessarily fuel it. Have I done anything wrong? Yes. Okay, then then there is a base for guilt, and maybe I should endure it a bit. Sometimes you just feel guilty, but have I done anything wrong? No. Okay, now it's irrational, and now I shall not fuel it. Either way, you probably have to endure it. <laughs> but there's that, um, for example, okay, so that, that, that inner voice, Mm. There was that one question: What should you do, should you do about that inner critic? Inner critic, yeah, inner yeah. Inner yeah, voice. Yeah. So I think that that actually goes exactly there. Well, <coughs> as I said, you, you messed up. You messed up real bad. You messed bad. up real You're bad. Such an idiot. Whatever it is, you'll never make it. <coughs> yeah. Well, as as painful as that is, you need to recognize that pretty much all of those mental states, inner critic, <coughs> sense of guilt, whatever else your mind is revolving around, are the symptoms of the problem. They're the results. So you don't want to just see them as a problem and then, oh, how do I stop the inner critic? No, you actually see inner critic as an indicator of a problem that you're not seeing. Because the, the, the power that that inner critic that your own mind has is the power you've been sort of feeding it through certain other actions that you're not aware of. And same, when like people have this irrational guilt constantly or irrational critic or something like that, it's the symptom of basically when those things are not present of your actions of your actions and choices. So in other words, you endure the inner critic, don't act out of it, don't feed it, don't argue with it either. Uh, but then when the inner critic goes away, then you keep an eye on your choices and things you do and things you think and things you allow your mind to revolve around because that's how you're providing fuel for the inner critic later on 
In other words, when inner critic is not there, the lack of awareness in, in regard to wholesomeness of your choices, actions, thoughts, themes that you entertain, the lack of awareness there, it's a pretty much a, um, a way of undermining yourself in a sense of when the inner critic comes, you are completely at its mercy. You have no, you can't say no, stop it to your own mind. So you just have to endure it because you put yourself in that position. And you, you can start to see the connection between your behavior, your choices, the mental themes throughout the day, things you do, things you say. Um, if, if, uh, if you start seeing inner critic or that irrational guilt or whatever else your mind revolves around in these negative states, see that as a symptom. Don't just try to get rid of that. But say, no, 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 this is the result of something else I do when this is not present. And when you start looking in that broader sense, the connection between the two will become apparent. Because that's the main thing. People don't see the connection. They don't see the connection between day-to-day -day behavior and their own liability to suffer on account of their own mind. Because for that, virtue, training, reflection, all that's required repetitively. You need to keep doing it. And wisdom would be the result of it when you start seeing the connection. And then you know for yourself. You don't need to take it on faith that a good behavior, restrained speech, restrained mind will result in the well-being of your mind. Kind of makes sense, but until you see the connection directly, you will be taking it on faith, which is fine, as long as it makes you make the right effort. But the point is, will come, if you are making that effort, that you're going to see it for yourself. Yeah. By basically keeping an eye on my behavior, virtues, uh, wholesome as well like you know you might not be breaking the precepts but you're engaging in pointless chit chat uh, gossip idle talk you know a bit of slander a bit of a bad mouth in this bit of that you know occasionally seeking distractions unnecessarily basically you are still not restrained as you should be and you're maintaining these unwholesome themes in your mind that then you know you're literally keeping your mind wild yeah. to that extent so when that wild mind decides to go its own way starts criticizing barking at you like a mad dog well you kept it mad you you kept it untrained so now you have to endure its barking and trying to bite you every now and then so when it calms down you better start training it yeah, you you have developed that uh, in that inner voice that that's what i mean there is you were inadvertently feeding it and keeping it wild to that extent so, yes, this needs to be dealt with, the inner voice, the inner critic, the inner guilt tripper. But it's actually the problem. It's not in that behavior. That's the result of an underlying problem that I've been inadvertently uh, not solving, such as you were keeping it wild through allowing it to mm -hmm. uncontrollably go and do things and, and so on. And that's, that's also something that, I mean, myself, I found that uh, when say going into a very extreme solitude mm. you get to see that inner voice very quickly yeah you sure. know when you got no distractions sure. you get to, you get to sure. see that inner voice very very quickly and it takes a while to calm down yeah. yeah and what's the difference there the difference is the environment of uh distraction yeah there was none so exactly so without a distraction it becomes apparent now because then see if if a wild dog or a semi-wild dog has its distractions, it won't bark at you. It will not try to, to, to bite you and harass you. You take away the distractions, it's going to start complaining. Yeah. And that's exactly what the mind does when you take it into solitude. Yeah. But I also remember, f also in my own experience, that going into solitude or, and then that inner voice becoming very apparent. Mm. It was also very irritating, you know what I mean? It was you like, were averse to it. Yeah, I was, wow, I, I, don't, I don't like this yeah. person, yeah. and yet I'm, I'm with this person 24-7. Yeah. And you're ignoring even your own aversion towards it because you were, you were being distracted through allowing distraction for it. Yeah. So keeping yourself equally oblivious. Um, and yeah. that's the important bit, you know, you, you get to see these things in solitude, and sooner or later you have to come out of the solitude and then realize... But I don't need to go back all the way to the distractions. I can come out of the extreme solitude or not necessarily live perpetually in the extreme solitude. But that's still not an excuse for me to now 
allow this animal to go back to the, its distractions and become wild again. And that's exactly the work. That's the training. That's the guarding of the senses. If the animal is tamed and you protect it from the unwholesome, you know, the baits we spoke about, which is always your responsibility. It's never, that they never can, the choices to accept the distraction, to accept lust, aversion, can never come from the environment. Those choices are always yours. The environment can provide you with hooks and baits, but you are the one always, every single time, responsible for choosing it. And uh, the more you become aware of that inner voice, the more you practice solitude and then you go out, you start to see that responsibility. So you realize, yeah, I can actually, this is a good balance between solitude, like non-extreme solitude and some degrees of solitude and so on. Um, and then you realize, okay, so I just all I need to do is just protect this animal, this animal, not feed it distractions, lust and aversion. And, uh, and then there is no basis for it to be barking at you and attacking you because it's still calm. It's not being agitated by things you allow it to agitate. It's also, I mean, when I saw that the inner voice that I wasn't liking was the complaining voice. Mm. And when there, was, when, when there was no distraction, that was clear that my mind was just complaining was, yeah, all yeah, the time yeah. about everything. Just and there was faults. nothing to... Yeah. Looking there was nothing faults. to... Yeah. Yeah. All the time. But I never noticed how much I was doing that. Right, right, right. Yeah. You know I mean? It was just all yeah. the time And see, all of that, all of that energy behind all that complaining yeah. has been generated, cultivated. The wildness of that animal has been maintained through the choices of distraction, aversion, lust, you know, not even major sort of, you know, lust or desires or something, but still, on a day-to-day -day basis, you kept your mind, that animal, you were allowing it to be sort of distracted, dependent on the external uh, sense objects one way or the other, and when that's taken away, it was left with that aversion now of complaining, attacking, barking, being a nuisance. Uh, but if you didn't yes, yeah. allow that animal to become distracted, there would be no basis for its yeah. complaining because it calmed, it calmed down. So whether it's in a critic, complaining voice, uh, guilt-tripping voice, you realize that that's a symptom of the choices, themes that I cultivate, maintain, and I'm careless about throughout the day when I'm not, you know, when the mind is not complaining and so on. Yeah. So just basically become more aware of things you choose to you know, do by body, by speech, by mind. And really, as I said, it's not this external observance of be virtuous, be virtuous. It, there is a direct connection between every single time you make this choice and how much, whether you, f whether you fuel, whether you encourage animal, animal's wildness or whether you're taming it through your choices. And if you, if you adhere to them rightly, it won't take long before you realize, oh, it's actually tamed. And that's the thing, solitude is a good uh, indicator, is it? Going solitude, solitude reveals the symptoms yeah. if there are any. Yeah. You go in that's all, that's exactly what I said. Listen. If a if a monk doesn't develop, um, doesn't delight in solitude, doesn't you know, make himself want solitude, he'll never g understand the nature of his mind. Well, why wouldn't he want solitude? Yeah. Well, exactly, exactly. Because why would a wild animal not want to become aware of its wildness? Because it's unpleasant. Yeah, it's unpleasant. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's dependent on distractions, and solitude takes those away. So. <clears throat> In terms of that failure, again, some uh, another friend asked. I don't know if we can say anything more on the subject. Mm -hmm. but, uh, in terms of failure, when you feel like you've let others down, let's say you fail fail your degree and feel miserable that you let let your family down mm. and see very lo little hope for the future. Mm. So he's quite concerned about, or seems to be overwhelmed by letting others down. Well, why is that a problem? Yeah. It's because it's unpleasant. So, it, it feels unpleasant here and now when others are disappointed with you and that's why it's a problem for you. Because, <clears throat> say you have, you have a person you don't care about, you don't even know, and they just stop you on the street and say, I'm really disappointed in you. <laughs> you wouldn't really care. You might want to curiously find out why, but who is this person to be disappointed with me anyway? So you want to recognize that the problem is you don't really want the pain of it. But if you don't want a pain of it, you should have been careful with your ambitions beforehand. 
because each time you want to achieve something, attain something, get something, there is a liability. You have to take responsibility for it. Like you might not succeed to that extent. And I'm not saying you shouldn't be ambitious. I'm just saying don't take it for granted, but take responsibility for it. Because if you keep the possibility of failure in your mind, well, the disappointment of others will already be implicit in that. And it will not surprise you or overwhelm you. So given that now you're overwhelmed, pretty much you have to endure the pain. It, can't, it won't last forever. When the pain fades away, reconsider your ambition. Find something else if you want to be ambitious about and do it. But don't just sort of blindly commit to it and forget that, yeah, you might not succeed. And, and you know, also fundamentally, others can always find reasons to be disappointed with you. So that's another thing perhaps you should reevaluate. Pleasing others how far you want to go with that because you know if you start going that way it is endless you can never please others because they will always have opinions and views and everything so sure you don't ignore you know others in that sense but especially you know your family people you live with but at the same time the point will come where you do need to draw some sort of line for yourself and for others as like well yeah but this is my life and my choices my responsibility my results Exactly. And then accept, you know, the nagging or being upset or whatever as part of that. You don't need to have ill will on account of that either. But if you are not mm -hmm. clear with mm -hmm. yourself, well, you will not be clear in regard to where that line is. And then... When people praise you or blame you, you just... Well, exactly. You will, you will not be able to sort of withstand it without losing perspective. So see, now it feels like, oh, it's, it's all ended or something, but it's, it's not. I mean, I'm sure that person has experienced this others being disappointed with them before in regard to something something else and it came and it went mm -hmm. so you don't need to completely dismiss it but you certainly shouldn't be like oh I must be pleasing others because even that it's rooted just because you don't want to suffer so when you feel like I must please others it's because it's too unpleasant for me when others are displeased for me uh, with me and again that's a that's impossible to achieve like if, if you think you can avoid the pain because of what others by preventing or, or providing others with what they want you're just going to suffer more as, as the in that one sutta the Buddha says it, nobody is fully blamed, fully or, blamed fully or fully praised nobody is praised all the time yeah, yeah. or blamed all the time even the target was blamed um, and, and even the worst people are sometimes praised so you have to accept that and accept that really the issue with that is like, again, you don't lose perspective. Yes, I failed. Maybe I could have done better. I should try and do better. But don't become irrational about it in a sense of, oh, but, but they're so disappointed. What are they? Because that's actually not about others. It's about you not wanting the unpleasantness of it. So you think by managing and providing others what they want, you can avoid this dukkha that you have to endure. But no, the only way to avoid the dukkha that you can endure is that you are enduring is by enduring it and taking responsibility for it and not trying to manage the external world in account to get rid of that which you're averse to. So that's really the problem. The problem of others being disappointed, the problem of others blaming you or something is that it just feels painful yeah. and you don't want to deal with that pain. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Sometimes they have a point, sometimes they don't. And if you want to maintain that perspective, you have to accept what you're feeling on account of others, not try to get rid of it. And see, by accepting the pain, you will also not have ill will towards them. Because you're not trying to get rid of dukkha. Accept the responsibility for it. You're enduring it, you're seeing it for what it is. So there's no aversion towards it. And then you get to see what they're complaining, what they're upset, what they're disappointed about. And it's like, actually, yeah, they have a point. And from that perspective, you will get to actually act accordingly and upgrade your behavior. But also sometimes you'll see, no, they're completely rational. They just want, mm -hmm. they just want what they want. They don't really even care about this. They just want what they want. And in that case, you will not entertain that and feed that further. You'll not be angry about it either, but you will certainly be able to remain unmovable. How to cultivate a sense of urgency as a lay person? What would be a practical approach to find motivation to make Dhamma practice a priority as a layperson? Well, incessant reflection on the nature of your situation. You need to make the effort. You don't think about it, the mind forgets, drifts away, gets pulled with sensuality, you lose sense of urgency. So you have to think about 
things that you are subjected to in that world so you know, sometimes it might be like a little prompt sometimes you might just have to sit and dwell on everything that could go wrong and that will bring you with anxiety and sense of urgency if you already have it you don't need to dwell on these things but if you want the, the, that that kind of a bit of a that sharpness to it because otherwise you can't move towards the direction of dhamma at all sensuality is too overwhelming then yeah I'm sure things would have happened to everyone in their life, things that they don't want to think about. So think about that, because it can happen again. I think about the fact that... Liability to suffering. Your priority is sensuality and not Dhamma. And you, yeah. you're struggling to get out, you're completely trapped. Mm. But again, like when sensuality comes, they would not necessarily feel the sense of urgency to, to restrain themselves. So you need to dwell on it, you need to sustain that context that will keep things urgent. Um, because always whoever asks that question they recognize that when they lose the urgency they kind of go back to sensuality and lose the practice and yeah that is not uncommon and even in the suttas the buddha would cut the buddha would basically scare monks light the fire on them by reminding them what's still there so they get the sense of urgency because they would have said because they still have work to do <laughs> so they just got negligent so you have to find something and then yeah cultivate it when it runs out find another thing they will bring a bit of anxiety and sense of urgency so that you can actually sustain your precepts and practice towards dhamma yeah. don't wait till it's too late don't wait until the world actually throws something at you they will fill you with anxiety and fear and be too much to handle so mm. start preparing yourself and training yourself for it already and you can as i said just just choose the right themes and it will it will arise yeah, sickness, and when you aging, sickness aging yes. death you know Loss. any basically form of dukkha discomfort suffering you experienced anything you fear you might you you you, you would experience anything you don't want to experience and you don't want to think about it all of that is all revealing that you're still liable to these things you're still liable to be affected by it think about it and you will feel oh i need to address this urgently <laughs> It, you, you, it will be a natural, natural outcome. Yeah.